Give, give, O magnanimous and liberal lord of the poor, cried the beggar. Avusulwutho Khan, the richest and most avaricious moneylender in all of Camorium, and by that token, in the whole of Hyperborea, was startled from his train of reverie by the sharp, eerie, cicada-like voice. He eyed the supplicant with acidulous disfavor. His meditations, as he walked homeward that evening, had been splendidly replete with the shining of costly metals, with coins and ingots and gold work and argentry, and the flaming and sparking of many tinted gems in rills, rivers, and cascades, all flowing toward the coffers of Avusul Wuthokan. Now the vision had flown, and this untimely and obstreperous voice was imploring for alms. I have nothing for you. His tones were like the grating of a shut clasp. Only two pazors, O gracious one, and I will prophesy. Avusul Wuthakan gave the beggar a second glance. He had never seen so disreputable a specimen in the mendacent class in all of his wayfarings through Camorium. The man was preposterously old, and his mummy-brown skin, wherever visible, was webbed with wrinkles that were like the heavy weaving of some giant jungle spider. His rags were no less than fabulous, and the beard that hung down and mingled with them was hoary as the moss of a primeval juniper. I do not require your prophecies. Only one Pazor, then. No. The eyes of the beggar became evil and malignant in their hollow sockets, like the heads of two poisonous little pit vipers in their holes. Then, O oh, of he hissed, I will prophesy gratis. Hearken to your weird the godless and exceeding love which you bear to all material things, and your lust thereafter, shall lead you on a strange quest, and bring you to a doom whereof the stars and the sun will alike be ignorant. The hidden opulence of earth shall allure you and ensnare you, and the earth itself shall devour you at the last. Be gone, said Avusul Wuthakan. The weird is more than a trifle cryptic in its earlier clauses, and the final clause is somewhat platitudinous. I do not need a beggar to tell me the common fate of mortality. It was many moons later, in that year which became known to pre-glacial historians as the Year of the Black Tiger. Avusul Wuthakan sat in the lower chamber of his house which was also his place of business. The room was obliquely shafted by the brief, aerial gold of the reddening sunset, which fell through a crystal window, lighting a serpentine line of erst sparks in the jewel-studded lamp that hung from copper chains, and touching to fiery life the torturous threads of silver and similar in the dark arises. Avusul Wuthakan, seated in an umber shadow beyond the Isle of Light, peered with an austere and ironic mane at his client, whose swarthy face and somber mantle were gilded by the passing glory. The man was a stranger, possibly a traveling merchant from outland realms, the usurer thought, or else an outsider of more dubious occupation. His narrow, slanting, barrel-green eye, his bluish, unkempt beard, and the uncouth cut of his sad raiment were sufficient proof of his alienage in Camorium. Three hundred jaws is a large sum, said the moneylender thoughtfully. Moreover, I do not know you. What security have you to offer? The visitor produced from the bosom of his garment a small bag of tiger skin, tied at the mouth with sinew, and opening the bag with a deft movement, 
poured on the table before Avusal Wuthakon two uncut emeralds of immense size and flawless purity. They flamed at the heart with a cold and ice-green fire as they caught the slanting sunset. And a greedy spark was kindled in the eyes of the usurer. But he spoke coolly and indifferently. It may be that I can loan you 150 jowls. Emeralds are hard to dispose of. And if you should not return to claim the gems and pay me the money, I might have reason to repent my generosity, but I will take the hazard. The loan is a mere tithe of their value, protested the stranger. Give me 250 jowls. There are other money lenders in Comorium, I am told. 200 jowls is the most I can offer. It is true that the gems are not without value, but you may have stolen them. How am I to know? It is not my habit to ask indiscreet questions. Take them, said the stranger hastily. He accepted the silver coins which Avusal Wuthakon counted out, and offered no further protest. The usurer watched him with a sardonic smile as he departed and drew his own inferences. He felt sure that the jewels had been stolen, but was in no wise perturbed or disquieted by this fact. No matter who they belonged to, or what their history, they would form a welcome and valuable addition to the coffers of Avusal Wuthakon. Even the smaller of the two emeralds would have been absurdly cheap at 300 jaws but the usurer felt no apprehension that the stranger would return to claim them at any time. No, the man was plainly a thief, and he had been glad to rid himself of the evidence of his guilt. As to the rightful owner of the gems, well, that was hardly a matter to arouse the concern or the curiosity of the moneylender. They were his own property now, by virtue of the sum in silver which had tacitly been regarded by himself and the stranger as a price rather than a loan. The sunset faded swiftly from the room, and a brown twilight began to dull the metal broideries of the curtains and the colored eyes of the gems. Avusal Wuthakon lit the fretted lamp, and then, opening a small brazen strongbox, he poured from it in a flashing rill of jewels on the table beside the emeralds. There were pale and ice-clear topazes from Mu Thulan, and gorgeous crystals of tourmaline from Sho Vulpanami. There were chill and furtive sapphires of the north, and arctic carnelians like frozen blood, and diamonds that were hearted with white stars. Red, unblinking rubies glared from the coruscating pile. Chatoyants shone like the eyes of tigers. Garnets and alibrondines gave their somber flames to the lamplight, amid the restless hues of opals. Also, there were other emeralds, but none so large and flawless as the two he had acquired that evening. Avusal Wuthakon sorted out the gems in gleaming rows and circles as he had done so many times before, and he set apart all the emeralds with his new acquisitions on one end, like captains leading a file. He was well pleased with his bargain, well satisfied with his overflowing caskets. He regarded the jewels with an avaricious love, a miserly complacence, and one might have thought that his eyes were little beads of jasper set in his leathery face as in the smoky parchment cover of some olden book of doubtful magic. Money and precious gems, these things alone, he thought, were immutable and non-volatile in a world of never-ceasing change and fungacity. His reflections at this point were interrupted by a singular occurrence. Suddenly and without warning, for he had not touched or disturbed them in any manner, 
the two large emeralds started to roll away from their companions on the smooth level table of black Uga wood. And before the startled moneylender could put out his hand to stop them, they had vanished over the opposite edge and had fallen with a muffled rattling on the carpeted floor. Such behavior was highly eccentric and peculiar, not to say unaccountable. But the usurer leapt from his feet with no other thought save to retrieve the jewels. He rounded the table in time to see that they had continued their mysterious rolling and were slipping through the outer door, which the stranger in departing had left slightly ajar. This door gave on a courtyard, and the courtyard, in turn, opened on the streets of Comorium. Avusul Wuthakon was deeply alarmed, but was more concerned by the prospect of losing the emeralds than by the eeriness and mystery of their departure. He gave chase with an agility of which few could have believed him capable, and throwing open the door, he saw the fugitive emeralds gliding with an uncanny smoothness and swiftness across the rough, irregular flags of the courtyard. The twilight was deepening to a nocturnal blue, but the jewels seemed to wink derisively with a strange, phosphoric luster as he followed them. Clearly visible in the gloom, they passed through the unbarred gate that gave on Principal Avenue and disappeared. It began to occur to Avusul Wuthakon that the gems were bewitched, but not even in the face of an unknown sorcery was he willing to relinquish anything for which he had paid the munificent sum of 200 jaws. He gained the open street with a running leap and paused only to make sure of the direction in which his emeralds had gone. The dim avenue was almost entirely deserted, for the worthy citizens of Comorium at that hour were preoccupied with the consumption of their evening meal. The jewels, gaining momentum and skimming the ground lightly in their flight, were speeding away on the left toward the less reputable suburbs and the wild, luxuriant jungle beyond. Avusul Wuthakon saw that he must redouble his pursuit if he were to overtake them. Panting and wheezing valiantly with the unfamiliar exertion, he renewed the chase, but in spite of all of his efforts, the jewels ran always in the same distance before him, with a maddening ease and eerie volition, tinkling musically at wiles on the pavement. The frantic and bewildered usurer was soon out of breath, and being compelled to slacken his speed, he feared to lose sight of the eloping gems. But strangely, thereafterward, they ran with a slowness that corresponded with his own maintaining ever the same interval. The moneylender grew desperate. The flight of the emeralds was leading him into an outlying quarter of Comorium where thieves and murderers and beggars dwelt. Here he met a few passers, all of dubious character, who stared in stupefaction at the fleeing stones, but made no effort to stop them. Then the foul tenements among which he ran became smaller, with wider spaces between, and soon there were only sparse huts, with furtive lights gleamed out in the full-grown darkness, beneath the lowering frondage of high palms. Still plainly visible and shining with a mocking phosphorescence, the jewels fled before him on the dark road. It seemed to him, however, that he was gaining upon them a little. His flabby arms and pursy body were faint with fatigue, and he was grievously winded, but he went on in renewed hope, gasping with eager avarice. A full moon, large and amber-tinted, rose beyond the jungle and began to light his way. Comorium was far behind him now, and there were no more huts on the lonely forest road, nor any other wayfarers. He shivered a little, either with fear or the chill of the night air, but he did not relax his pursuit. He was closing in on the emeralds, very gradually but surely, and he felt that he would recapture them soon. So engrossed was he in the weird chase, with his eyes on the ever-rolling gems, that he failed to perceive that he was no longer following an open highway. Somehow, somewhere, he had taken a narrow path, 
that wound among monstrous trees, whose foliage turned the moonlight to a mesh of quicksilver with heavy, fantastic rattlings of ebony. Crouching in grotesque menace, like a giant Raytari, they seemed to close in on him from all sides. But the moneylender was oblivious of their shadowy threats, and heeded not the sinister strangeness and solitude of the jungle path nor the dank odors that lingered beneath the trees like unseen pools. Nearer and nearer, he came to the fleeting gems, till they ran and flickered tantalizingly a little beyond his reach, and seemed to look back at him like two greenish glowing eyes filled with allurement and mockery. Then, as he was about to fling himself forward in a last and supreme effort to secure them, they vanished abruptly from view, as if they had been swallowed by the forest shadows that lay like sable pythons athwart the moonlit way. Baffled and disconcerted, Avusul Wuthakon paused and peered in bewilderment at the place where they had disappeared. He saw that the path ended in a cavern mouth yawning blankly and silently before him, and leading to unknown subterranean depths. It was a doubtful and suspicious-looking cavern fanged with sharp stones and bearded with queer grasses. And Avusul Wuthakon, in his cooler moments, would have hesitated a long while before entering it. But just then, he was capable of no other impulse than the fervor of the chase and the prompting of avarice. The cavern that had swallowed his emeralds in a fashion so nefarious was a steep incline running swiftly down into the darkness. It was low and narrow, and slippery with noisome oozings, but the moneylender was heartened as he went on by a glimpse of the glowing jewels, which seemed to float beneath him in the black air, as if to illuminate his way. The incline led to a level winding passage in which Avusul Wuthakon began to overtake his elusive property once more, and hope flared high in his panting bosom. The emeralds were almost within reach. Then, with slightful suddenness, they slipped from his ken beyond an abrupt angle of the passage, and following he paused in wonder, as if halted by an irresistible hand. He was half blinded for some moments by the pale, mysterious, bluish light that poured from the roof and walls of the huge cavern into which he had emerged. And he was more than dazzled by the multi-tinted splendor that flamed and glowed and glistened and sparkled at his very feet. He stood on a narrow ledge of stone, and the whole chamber before and beneath him, almost to the level of this ledge, was filled with jewels even as a granary is filled with grain. It was as if all the rubies, opals, beryls, diamonds, amethysts, emeralds, crystallites, and sapphires of the world had been gathered together and poured into an immense pit. He thought that he saw his own emeralds, lying tranquilly and decorously in a nearer mound of the undulant mass. But there were so many others of like size and flawlessness that he could not be sure of them. For a while, he could hardly believe the ineffable vision. Then, with a single cry of ecstasy, he leapt forward from the edge, sinking almost to his knees in the shifting and tinkling and billowing gems. In great double handfuls, he lifted the flaming and skintling stones and let them sift between his fingers slowly and voluptuously, to fall with the light clash on the mountainous heap. Blinking and joyously, he watched the royal lights and colors run in spreading or narrowing ripples. He saw them burn like steadfast coals and secret stars, or leap out in blazing eyes that seemed to catch fire from one another. In his most audacious dreams, the usurer had never even suspected the existence of such riches. He babbled aloud in a rhapsody of delight as he played with the numberless gems. 
and he failed to perceive that he was sinking deeper with every moment into the unfathomable pit. The jewels had risen above his knees, were engulfing his pudgy thighs, before his avarice rapture was touched by any thought of peril. Then, startled by the realization that he was sinking into his newfound wealth, as into some treacherous quicksand, he sought to extricate himself and returned to the safety of the ledge. He floundered helplessly, for the moving gems gave way beneath him, and he made no progress but went deeper still, till the bright, unstable heap had risen to his waist. Avusil Wuthakon began to feel a frantic terror amid the intolerable irony of his plight. He cried out, and as if in answer, there came a loud, unctuous, evil chuckle from the cavern behind him. Twisting his fat neck with painful effort so that he could peer over his shoulder, he saw a most peculiar entity that was crouching on a sort of shelf above the pit of jewels. This entity was holy and outrageously unhuman, and neither did it resemble any species of animal or any known god or demon of Hyperborea. Its aspect was not such as to lessen the alarm and panic of the moneylender, for it was very large and pale and squat, with a toad-like face and a swollen, squidgy body, and numerous cuttlefish limbs or appendages. It lay flat on the shelf with its chinless head and long, slit-like mouth overhanging the pit, and its cold, lidless eyes peering obliquely at a Vusulwuthakon. The usurer was not reassured when it began to speak in a thick and loathsome voice, like the molten tallow of corpses dripping from a wizard's kettle. Ah, what have we here? It said, By the black altar of Sotholua, Tis a fat moneylender, wallowing in my jewels like a lost pig in a quagmire. Help me! cried Avusil Wuthakon. See you not that I am sinking? The entity gave its oleaginous chuckle. <laughs> yes, I see your predicament. Of course. What are you doing here? I came in search of my emeralds, two fine and flawless stones for which I have just paid the sum of two hundred jaws. Your emeralds? said the entity. I fear that I must contradict you. The jewels are mine. They were stolen not long ago from this very cavern, in which I have been wont to gather and guard my subterranean wealth for many ages. The thief was frightened away when he saw me, and I suffered to let him go. He had taken only the two emeralds, and I knew that they would return to me as my jewels always return. Whenever I chose to call them, the thief was lean and bony, and I did well to let him go, for now, in his place, there is a plump and well-fed Avusil Wuthakon, in his mounting terror, was barely able to comprehend the words or to grasp their implications. He had sunk slowly but steadily into the yielding stone, and green, yellow, red, and violet gems were blinking gorgeously about his bosom and sifting with a light tinkle beneath his armpits. Help! Help! he wailed. I shall be engulfed! Grinning sardonically, and showing the cloven tip of a fat white tongue, 
the singular entity slid from the shelf with a boneless ease, and spreading its flat body on the pool of the gems into which it hardly sank, it slithered forward to a position from which it could reach the frantic usurer, with its octopus-like members. It dragged him free with a single motion of incredible celerity. Then, without pause or preamble or further comment, in a leisurely and methodical manner, it began to devour him. <laughs>